Okay, so <clears throat> this mimer we're going to be learning is Adam Kiyakumikem. This mimer is a very fundamental mimer from the Alter Rebbe. As you see on top of the page, it's printed in the Kuti Torah. And we know that uh, men start learning Chassidus about a little bit before Bar Mitzvah, after Bar Mitzvah, first they start learning Tanya, and then they learn something light, Maimorim that are very easy. When they start learning the Al-Tarebbe's Maimorim, the first Maimor probably that they would learn would be this Maimor, because it's so fundamental. We do have this mimer Hebrew English. I went to all the stores and uh, no one has it, it's out of print. So from that, you can tell that everybody must be learning this mimer. And uh, our copy machine is on strike still, <laughs> but hopefully after the copy machines work, we will make copies in Hebrew English, It'll be easier to follow. <clears throat> However, before we start the mimer, um, I'd like to, Talk a little bit about the day today. Today is a very special day, the city calendar. And we refer to this day as Teferis Shabbat Teferis. So if you look at how Yom Yom, it says that when the Rebbe Marash, the fourth Rebbe of Chabad, was a young child, his teacher had taken him to the Tzemach Tzedek, to his father, and Tzemach Tzedek tested him. And in the test, he performed uh, in the, uh, out of the ordinary way. And the teacher got all excited. And even though that's not the normal way to speak to Rebbe, but he got so excited, he said, Rebbe, so what do you say? Look how, he's, he, look how good he's do, he does. And the Rebbe Tzemach Tzedek answered, what's the wonder that the Ferris and the Ferris is doing so good? So Rebbe Marash was born on this day which is the second day of year. And in terms of the spheres, it's Teferis within Teferis. What's so unique about Teferis and Teferis? That's another discussion. <clears throat> but in generally, in gen generally speaking, Chassidus explains that Teferis, even, on one, even though on one hand it's the third uh, sphere after Chesed, the word Teferis, but in essence, Teferis is connected to Chesed, which is to the infinite or in self, and uh, there's much, much more about it. But I want to talk a little bit is about the Rebbe Menashe himself. So you have here these booklets. Usually whatever you put in there stays, doesn't move. But I would advise you to take it, read it, and, and to know a little bit more about the Rebbe Menashe. But let me give over a few things, and then, and then we'll go on with the minor. So first of all, the Rebbe Marash um, was born on this day, and he was nostalgic on the 13th of Tisha, which means literally two days before Sukkot. He was 48 years old. That's probably the youngest of all the Rabbein. And in general, he was not well. He was, uh, had certain medical uh, issues. And he passed away at the age of 48. We know that every Rebbe is unique. On one hand, every Rebbe is a continuation and it's a golden chain that starts from the Alter Rebbe to the next Rebbe to the next Rebbe. Every Rebbe continues what the previous Rebbe began, but just spreads it out more and more and develops this more and more. But nevertheless, every Rebbe has something unique. What's unique about the Rebbe Marash is there's a term that's used and found in the Sikhs that the Rebbe Marash conduct, conducted himself in the Balshemska way. That's the expression. Which means when you hear stories of the Balshem, it's not only that he performed miraculous things, but he performed the miraculous thing in a very open way. Later generations, all the different tzaddikim, especially the Rebbe's of Chabad, specifically 
And with an emphasis, whenever they would perform a miracle, it would be camouflaged. You'd have to look twice to see clearly that it was a miracle. It was deliberately camouflaged because that has to do with the Aveda of Chabad. The Vashemta's miracles were very open, wild, totally out of the ordinary uh, of nature. And the Rebbe Marash conducted himself similar to the Vashemta. There are a number of stories of things that he did. I'm going to tell you a certain story soon. And this indicates how the Rebbe Marash did things in such a way. One of those stories is actually what happened when he was nostalgic. Even though he was not well, but no one expected that he'd pass away. He, was, he wasn't critically ill at the time. He was weak. He called the Gabbai, and he told the Gabbai that I want to speak to my sons. He had three sons. And before he did that, he took his watch. In those days, people had these watches that were attached to a chain. They wore a vest, and the watch was in a pocket of the vest. He took out that watch took a piece of paper, took the handle of the, of the, of the clock, of his watch, and he put it to a certain time, I think it says 20 after 11. Put a piece of paper under it so it shouldn't move. So it was stuck at 20 after 11. And then he called in his sons and spoke to them. And exactly, precisely at 20 after 11, he was nostalgic. Or like a shock to everybody. The Rebbe Rashab was sick for a very long time from shock, it appears, from everything that happened. And the Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe Rashab, his successor, was only 22 years old at the time. So he became a Rebbe at the age of 22. So he's also known, and this is also something very interesting, that the Rebbe Marash is known by the term the Chathila River. Why am I saying it's interesting? Because there's a letter from the Free the Rebbe that the Rebbe Maharaj once said that out there in the world, people say, if you can't go under, then you go over. And I say, L'chatchile go over. Not first try to go under. If it doesn't succeed, then go over. But L'chatchile go over. It's a letter from the Friedrich Rebbe about something the Rebbe Maharaj once said. But our Rebbe took that pisgum, took that phrase, and he said that this defines the Rebbe Marash. It's not just a, a statement he made. This defines his whole way of life, his whole approach to Chassidus, whole approach to everything in Yiddishkeit, to the extent that whenever the Rebbe would mention the Rebbe Marash, he would always say the Rebbe Marash, the Chathila River. And there were times where the Rebbe didn't even say the Rebbe Marash. He would say to sing, uh, or uh, it's a mimer of the Rebbe of the Chathila River. In other words, the Lechatchila River phrase became so much connected to Rebbe Marash, it, as if it almost became his name. So there's a lot of discussion, what does Lechatchila River mean? It can be explained in many different ways. So first of all, what I just mentioned, that's part of it. Lechatchila River means not we do things in a natural way, but there's some sort of a miracle hidden in it, but openly in the most exposed way, where he did, did things that were beyond nature, openly. And then the Chathila River could, could take on many different uh, explanations, it could be applied in many different ways. So generally speaking, what it's referring to is obstacles. When people have obstacles in their lives, there are challenges, whether these are challenges on a communal level or challenges challenges on a personal level. Generally speaking, something's in your way, you push it out of the way. If you can't push it out of the way, then you climb over. That's in a sense the expression. If you can't go under, then you go over. And the Rabbi Marash said, l'chatchila a river. So this would be similar, and, by, and, and I said that the Rabbi was the one who really took this phrase, and really it almost became the Rabbi's phrase, because the Rabbi's approach to everything in Exodus and Aveda is also the Chathila River. <coughs> to give you an example of a few things, how it applies on a communal level, and the same would be on a personal level. There's a letter where someone writes to the Rebbe, he has a, a, I don't think there were Chabad houses in that time when he wrote this in the 1950s, but he had you know, a position in the city, 
and he was spreading chesedus, and he was there teaching people the path of Chabad, and there were others who were against him, and they tried to undermine him. And he wrote the rabbi like a letter where he's really very frustrated and broken whenever he tries to do these people. I'm talking about people who are religious people, but against Lubavitch, and they're trying to stop him and stand in his way. So the rabbi answers him that when the Alter Rebbe was arrested, we know that one of the things that happened after the arrest was the Alter Rebbe had promised someone. Uh, no, when the Alter Rebbe was arrested, we know when he went out of jail, he first went into the house of a Misnagid, of one of the people that were part of the opposition. And not only that, but probably one of the people who were instrumental in getting him arrested. And by mistake, the guards brought the Alter Rebbe to that apartment and he locked the door and he held the Alter Rebbe hostage for three hours and all sorts of things were going on at the time. Finally, the Chassidim found the Alter Rebbe because they were looking for him for three hours. They had no idea where he was. And they found the Alter Rebbe um, and they were ready to leave. The Alter Rebbe said, it says, 10 covered lachsayna. You should honor your host. This person was my host for three hours even though he tortured the Alter Rebbe, he tormented him verbally. The Alter Rebbe said that the three hours that he spent in this person's apartment, where he spoke, and he spoke against the Voshemtov, and against the Magid, and against the Chassidus, and he expressed himself in the most disrespectful way, the Alter Rebbe said the suffering that he had in these three hours was worse than all the 53 days that he sat in the jail. Nevertheless, he was my host for these three hours, so we'll honor him, I'll drink a cup of tea. And this person poured the cup of tea to the Alter Rebbe. So the Rebbe writes that many years later, the Alter Rebbe said he regrets that he drank the cup of tea in this person's house. Why? The Alter Rebbe said, because on, on the one hand, this looks like he's, even though he's in the opposition, he's respecting him. On the other hand, it gave that person too much substance. And the Rebbe concludes, the reason why you're having opposition in your city and all these people are opposing you is because you're giving them too much substance. If you just disregard it and ignore it and just do what you have to do, you will see that all the opposition will just melt. That's called the Khatkhila River. One way is this opposition, I'm gonna wrestle with it and I'm gonna fight with it and I'll overpower it and I'll, I'll pull it down, get it out of the way and move ahead. That's not a river. A river means to go over, means just to ignore it, pretend that it doesn't exist, act as if there's nothing standing in your way, and eventually you'll see that it'll be gone. And the same applies on a personal level. Different kinds of challenges we have, which most of them start in the head, which means thoughts that are disturbing, thoughts that are depressing, thoughts that are questioning and challenging, and all sorts of things that go on. One way is to wrestle with it, and to argue with my own thoughts and try to push them out of the way. And the other way, which is the Rebbe's approach, is the Chathila River, don't give it any substance. Don't pay any attention to it. Just keep moving. Pretend that it's not there. Uh, uh, distract yourself to something else, and you'll see that ultimately it'll stop. And whoever is familiar with the Rebbe's letters, the Rebbe's sikhs, the Rebbe's answers to the people on personal level about different issues, it's always the same, same approach. And the idea of Bitochen, trying good with Zangu is exactly the same thing. It's got to be a crisis. And you're worried that something's going to happen. And people are filled with fear and anxiety and trying to think of what they can do about it. And the Rebbe's approach is Trag good. Just picture in your mind that it's over and things worked out. And if you think that way, it'll be that way. In other words, Rather than dealing with the possibility of this crisis uh, coming to fruition and God forbid, who knows what's going to happen, how am I going to deal with it? Just go above it. There is no crisis. Just be positive and you'll see that it'll go away, which is in essence what the true Bittachan is all about. And as we spoke about this once before, the Rebbe would advise people, sometimes if somebody was sick and the situation was really very uh, serious, I would say, to make a Suda Sadar. Suda Sadar means a meal, a feast, where you're thanking Hashem for saving your life or saving someone else's life. 
You usually do that when the person's life is saved. The Rebbe would tell people to do that while there was a crisis. You should demonstrate that you have so much to be talking to Hashem that it's going to be good that you're already making this Suda, you're already making this uh, Thanksgiving party. And if you have that approach, it'll, it'll go away. So that's the definition of the Chathila River. And the Rebbe explains that the Rebbe Manash sort of opened a new path. And I, I would say, and I told you this, I think many times that in the world of psychology, the non-Jewish world, the secular world, is also shifting much, much more to this, to this direction of, of uh, instead of, instead of um, delving into the past and analyzing where is it coming from, this is from my mother and this is from my grandmother. And this is from my great grandmother's uncle's cousin. And this is from this and this is from that. And that's why I fell this way. And that's why this is what I went through. Forget about all that. Just disregard, ignore, move on with your life. And you'll see that a lot of the things that are getting in the way will just, will just disappear. And some of you must have heard this from me in the beginning of the year. But one time when we spoke about the subject, someone showed me an article of a psychologist, not a chassid, not Jewish, then Jewish psychologist. And actually that's what his article is all about, that don't give it substance, don't pay any attention. And the term that he used was, if you remember, don't feed the cat. You feed the cat, it keeps coming back. If you don't want the cat to keep coming back, don't put any milk on the porch. So his thing was, don't feed the cat. And um, cat is an acronym for counterproductive attitudes and thoughts. Don't feed it. If you don't feed it, it won't come back. This is really what it says in Chassidus. To a certain extent, CBT is what Chassidus is all about. Just change the way you think, change your perspective, and automatically there won't be a problem, rather than wrestling with the issue and trying to struggle with it. Just take on a different perspective and you'll see. And that's really the, the approach of Chassidus. And that's the Chathila River. So, to give an example of, of what does it mean about, that the uh, Rebbe Marash did things in a Boshemska way, I'll tell you this story. The story was written by the previous Rebbe. There are a lot of details. I'm just going to give the main part of the story. And hopefully, we'll still have some time to start the mining. Basically, this was in a time when the free Rebbe was not the Rebbe yet. And nevertheless, he was very involved in all sorts of communal issues. And he was on a, on a journey going somewhere to do things that had to be done for the community. He was traveling, I don't, I'm not sure which country, he was on the train, one of these trains that go from city to city. And on the train, they have a, one car which has food, there's a restaurant there. And he never said he went there to get himself water, to make himself a cup of tea. And as he walks in, he sees someone sitting by the table. He sees clearly it's a Jewish face. And he's eating the food that's there, which is clearly tray of meat. This person, when he saw the free the Garaba, he like, he was jolted. His face turned red. And um, he walked over to the free the Garaba, stopped eating. And he said to him, Shalom Aleichem. And he said, are you a son of the Rebbe Maharaj or are you a grandson? The Rebbe said, I'm a grandson. And as soon as he said these words, he started to cry. Then he walked away, went over to the waiters, paid them, didn't finish eating, and he left. As the train stopped at one of the stations, the Rebbe said, I went outside to catch some fresh air. And he comes outside too and he walks over to me. And he says, I want to tell you something amazing. And as soon as he said these words, he got very emotional. Tears started to come from his eyes. He couldn't speak. And before he got a chance to say anything, the train was already moving. He went back onto the train. He got off at another stop, walked over to the Friedrich Kurebbe, said good morning, and he said to him, I couldn't sleep all night. Still didn't say what was the issue. But then he said at a certain point, 
uh, conducting the train came to the Friedrich Rebbe and said, there's someone here that wants to see you on the train. He said, okay, he can come in. He walks in and he's still very emotional and again starts crying. And the Friedrich Rebbe said, I'm looking at this man. He looks like he's somewhere in his 50s. And he was dressed like one of the upper class people in Russia. Not really in a very Jewish way, but like, like, the, like the Russian people. And He's covering his face, crying. His body is literally shaking. And I couldn't decide, should I try to calm him? Should I just let him be? Is he upset about something? Or is he emotionally just not a stable person? Maybe a tragedy happened. Finally, the person, the free gift said, I couldn't, I couldn't control myself. And I just said to him, what was, what's going on? I tried to calm him down. And then he said to the Friedrich Grabber, could you do me a favor? Lend me your children. And again, he started to cry. Of course, the Friedrich Grabber realized that he's going through some sort of a spiritual turmoil, very clearly. He gave him the children, his talus, the sitter, said, I'm walking out of the room so he can have the room for himself and pour out his heart. And later, in the evening, he came to the Friedrich Rebbe. His face was pale, the Friedrich Rebbe said. And he told him in a very sort of whispering voice. He was talking as if he was sick or something. And he said, I want to tell you my story. And he started to tell him the story. And he told him who he is, who his father was. His father was a chassid of the Rebbe Marash. And at a certain point, they moved from where they lived to Petersburg. And when they moved to Petersburg, he met um, kids who were not Jewish, big city, and they became friendly. And that's when he started to lose it in terms of, in terms of Yiddishkeit. His father, when he went to Lubavitch, he was a chassid of the Rebbe Marash, he would take him along. And when he went into Rebbe Marash, uh, his father gave him, this person, gave, the Rebbe Marash gave him a bracha, and he told him, you should always remember that you're a Yid, because the place that you are, it's a very dangerous place. Hasidim in those days used to avoid living in the big cities because of that reason. Then he says he remembers how the first time he forgot, not forgot, he skipped Davening Mincha. Then another time he skipped Davening Mairiv. And then he skipped Davening Shachris. And then during the summer, he was playing with these friends all day long. And he said that when he came home, to be, when he came to Shul on Rosh Hashanah, the whole scene looked foreign to him already. Like, he didn't feel like he belonged there. Basically, he became sort of, it, it became something which was foreign to him, and he moved away. I mean, spiritually moved away. But then he came to his father and asked him for money. And his father said to him, I'll give you all the money you want, but on one condition, I want you to cut off your ties with his friends. And he gave him the the classical answer, I'm a big boy, I make my own decisions, I don't need your money, and I'll do what I want, and I moved out of the house, we never saw each other again after that. Then he said he joined a group of young, they call themselves progressive uh, Russian kids, they got involved in political things, and Davka and helping Jews, it had nothing to do with Yiddish guy, just helping Jews physically from different things that were going on, to, to protect them and, and they should be able to benefit. So he said that they found, they knew that the Rebbe Manash is very involved. In fact, the reason why the Rebbe Manash was in Stalag, when I say the reason, we're not, uh, not talking about Hashem, we're talking about, of course, Hashem has his reasons, but what was happening down here was a very difficult time for the Jews in Russia at the time. There were pogroms and the Rebbe Manash went to different government agencies and met with different ministers and he prevented a lot of the pogroms. Eventually, it was stopped completely, but there were plans, unfortunately, in those days to literally uh, have pogroms all over the country. So they said, we were involved in our political activities. We knew information that nobody knew. And I wanted to share that information with the Rebbe Marash. So I heard that he's in Petersburg and he's gonna be in this hotel, this place, so they went there. But how do we get to speak to them? No one's gonna let us in to speak to them. We can't tell them that we're doing this underground sort of work. So they were standing there when the Rebbe Nash walked out 
And he said that uh, the Rebbe Rash hadn't seen him all these years. And of course, he changed drastically over these years. And nevertheless, as soon as the Rebbe Rash saw him, he immediately recognized him. And he said to him, Shalom Aleichem, do you remember the last mimer that you heard when you were in Lubavitch? That was his first words to him. And he got, uh, he was in shock. He was like, overwhelmed. He, he couldn't even say what he wanted to say. So one of his friends said to the Rebbe Marash, we have something urgent to talk to you about. Could we please speak to you? They told him to come into the room and they shared the different things that they shared. And then he was there by the Rebbe Marash himself. And the Rebbe Marash said to him, tell me, how long is it that you haven't put on film? Before I had a chance to answer, how does he know that I don't put on film? But before I had a chance to answer, the Rebbe Marash said, and if you'll tell me that you do put on film, I'll tell you everything you did, when you did it, and where you did it. And he said he started to tell him every step that he went down, how he stopped doing this, stopped doing that. In this place, he did this, and in that place, he did that, as if he was following him all along. Of course, it was open, and this is an example of Baal Shem's Khan Hoga. The rabbis don't usually do that. They might know much more than what they say, but they're not opening it and tell people, I know that on Tuesday afternoon, three o'clock, you were here, and on Wednesday you were there, and Friday you did that. They gave him a rundown, a report of everything that he did, how he slowly, gradually went away from Yiddishkeit. And he said he lost it, he just started to cry, and uh, it did have an effect on him. After that, he went out and bought himself a bar of film from somebody, and he made up his mind, he's only gonna eat kosher. He didn't even tell his wife. Every day he used another excuse. He has a stomach ache, it doesn't feel good. Eventually he told her that he wants to eat only kosher. And for about a year, it worked. There are more and more details to the story. But uh, one of the last times that it came to the Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe Marash married off one of his children and the Rebbe Marash sent him an invitation to come to the wedding. In fact, that's how his father found out. His father was the Rebbe Marash the Rebbe Marash gave his father an invitation to the wedding and wrote down, and please invite your son. His father was shocked. He had no idea that he had any connection with the Rebbe Marash. And Rebbe Marash is inviting my son. He didn't even uh, have a connection to his son. He found out where he lives, and he came and he brought him the invitation. And he said, I have no idea in what merit the Rebbe Marash is inviting you, but he gave me the shlichus, so I'm giving it to you, goodbye. And he was ready to leave. He begged him to stay. And then he shared with his father his relationship with Rebbe Marash, everything that's going on. So that last time when he came, he met with Rebbe Marash and he told him about something that he knew, which was nobody knew, this was inside information about a specific program that's being planned, who's planning it, how they're planning it. So the Rebbe Marash said, I'm gonna be going away now, come back later in the afternoon. When he came back, he said, I was by the Ayo, and my father doesn't think that the situation is so severe. His father is the Tzemach Tzedek. So he obviously spoke to the Tzemach Tzedek by the oil, and the Tzemach Tzedek told him the situation is not so severe. And then when he, when he, when he spoke to him, he said to him like this um, later, when he spoke to him later, he said, I noticed that when I told you that I spoke to my father, I saw in your face that you were like, Smirking, almost. not physically, but in your head. Not because you don't believe, but because you're so immersed in this materialistic world that Ruchni just doesn't register anything that's a little bit higher. But he actually spoke to the Rebbe Tzemach Tzedek, and they discussed the matter, and he told him that it's not so severe. And then he said to him these words, Zreik Chutra Aikra Koi. It's an expression of Gemara. When you throw a stick in the air, it'll fall down on the part that's connected to the roots, which means when a person, figuratively speaking, goes far away, he's gonna come back to his roots. You should always remember who you are. You're a son of a chassid, a grandson of a chassid, a great grandson of a chassid. And then he said to him, how many years could a person wander and give in to their passions blood boiling with all sorts of physical passions, 50 years, 55 years as a limit, eventually. So he said to the, Rebbe, the previous Rebbe that every year on his birthday, 
he uh, has a party with his friends. Five years ago, his wife passed away. And from that point on, he used to make the party somewhere in a different country, in a different place. And he just had a party in, in, in Italy. All his friends came. They had a great time. And now he's going back home. And he told the free together, I just celebrated my 55th birthday. When I saw your face, the Friedrich Rebbe's face resembled the Rebbe Marash's. We have no picture of the Rebbe Marash, but it says there was a striking resemblance to the extent that when the Friedrich Rebbe came to visit Israel, the Friedrich Rebbe was in Israel in 1929. So there were chassidim there from the times of the Rebbe Marash. One of the chassidim walked in to see the Friedrich Rebbe and he fainted. He fainted because the resemblance was so striking that he felt that he's looking at the Rebbe Marash. So he said, when I saw your face, I remembered your grandfather. And I remembered his words, it suddenly began ringing my ears. How long could this go on? 50, 55. And today I just celebrated my 55th birthday. Then he broke down crying and he became a lot sugar from that point on. It changed his life. The free guy was in touch with him until the late day of his life. But this is an example of what it means for Shem's Kanhaga to tell a person in advance not just that you'll come back and you'll be back, but to give this precise 55 years, which means it was his 55th birthday and that's when it all happened. And the freedom concludes, imagine the Reverend Maharash injected in this person a fire, a godly fire, and the godly fire wasn't flaring up for 30 something years. And then finally it burst and, and he became a monk sugar. Everything has its time. But this is an example of what, what means uh, Chathila River and Balshem Skan Hoga to do things in a way which is completely, totally in the mind of my teva. And we have now a few minutes, so we can start the mind. Okay. So what are you supposed to do in a day like today? You get a little bit of extra stucker. Try to learn something from the Rebbe Marash. What we did was we didn't learn, but we told the story of the Rebbe Marash. And people for brain. Did you for brain ever happen last night? She oh, never no. showed up, right? Okay, what? She's coming tomorrow. Yeah. Something must have happened. Yeah. Okay. What is that? 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 is Yiddish way of speaking. Okay. And hunger means. Hashem's way of conducting himself. And hug in Hebrew means conduct. Okay. So this is an apostolic in Vayikra where it starts to talk about Korbanus. And it says the following. The passage begins with these words. Adam ki yakir mikem. A person amongst you would bring a carbon. And the passage goes on to say how you can bring the carbon, which animals you can use to bring a carbon. The hagen to understand a few questions in the passage. The first question is, The grammar begins in a way which is third party. It doesn't say you will, it said if a person will, Adam Kiyakri, Lashanista, the seam, but then the Pasa concludes with these words, Takrivu as Korbanchem, you should bring your carbon. So it's inconsistent. Starts off speaking in a third party, and it's then it speaks direct. You will bring the carbon. That's one question. Begam, another question. Adam Kiyakriv, Yakriv in Hebrew is Lashan Yachim, the singular. And when it says takrivu, you will bring your carbon. We all know when you have a vav at the end of a word, it's plural. It starts off singular, ends off with plural. Korban chem, also when it says chem at the end of a word, alakei chem, es chem, it always means you plural. Lashon rabbi. That's the second question. The third question is it starts off adam ki yakir mikem. The person will bring a carbon from you. The word mikem should have been written before kiyakri. 
It should have said like this, other can, a person amongst you will bring a carbon. The language doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, fit. It's saying a person will bring a carbon from you. So these are the three questions. So now it begins to explain what is the union of a carbon. And then we'll understand that the passage is talking about two different things. And that's why there's singular and there's plural. There's third party and there's direct because it's talking about two things, which we'll soon see what that is. He may know that it's known. Every person has bays and fashes, two souls. Never show the kiss, but never show Bahamas. And the difference is nefesh al is the godly soul, shosha mepkina soul. And we know what the difference is between the godly soul and the animal soul. But here he's talking about the source. Everything down here comes in the spiritual realm. Everything has its roots in the spiritual realm. Even nefesh Bahamas. But the, the root and the source is in a different place. The source of Adam, the source of a nefesh al is from the level that's called Adam. Commercial custom, as it says, by Yimra Elakim Esadam B'Tzalman, that Hashem created the man in His image. How could you say that Hashem has no image? He has no form. He has no shape. How could you say that the, the image of a person is the image of Hashem? So it's referring to a pasuk in Yecheskel, the famous story where he saw a, 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 a prophetic vision. And in this prophetic vision, you saw the chariot. And the chariot, which, which, is, which itself is a metaphor, and there were animals that were pulling the chariot, that's also a metaphor. On the chariot, there was a throne, that's a metaphor. And on the throne, there was a person. And that's as if a metaphor for Hashem sitting on the throne. But in this metaphor, it refers to the one that's sitting on the throne as the Adam. While the Musa say on this form of the throne, the most Kumar Adam is something like Adam, like a person, which means Chas Shalom up there, it's a spiritual world, but it means that there's a level up there, and that's the level that's on the throne, that's on the for the Nefesh kiss. So the Nefesh kiss is in the image of that Adam. Basically, it means Hashem is infinite, and of course Hashem has no form and no shape. But Hashem did create, not create, but Hashem did manifest of himself the ten spheres. And they have a certain structure, these ten spheres. The structure of a, of a Nefesh Alekiz down here, with Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gevur, Tepes, and all that, is evolves from that spiritual realm, which has... And when it evolves, it also has to go through another level, which is also Adam, but it's a lower level. What is that? So when it describes the chariot, it says there were four faces. One was the face of a lion, one was the face of an eagle, and one was the face of an ox. It says in these, these animals are not animals, they're really angels. So why do we refer to angels as animals? And the answer is because these angels are the source of all the animals down here. And why these three animals? Because they are the kings, so to speak. The lion is the king of all wildlife. The ox is the king of all domestic and farm animals. And the eagle is the king of all the birds. When we say king, it means that spiritually, this is the head. This is the source where all the birds get their highs from. And the ox is where all the farm and domestic animals get their highs from. And the, eat, and the lion is where all the wildlife gets their highs from. Then there's a fourth face, which is the face of an Adam, of a person. So what he's saying is that the face of the Adam, that is a lower level. So basically, there are three levels. There's Adam on the throne. There's Adam, which is one of the faces. And then from there, it comes down here to be the Nefesh in inside our, our body. And where does Nefesh come from? 
Hope you'll be able to survive until tomorrow. We'll learn about the Nevesha Mahamas. In your session. Thank you. Thank you.